Hello and welcome to Pastor Well. I'm Herschel York, Dean of the School of Theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm also Senior Pastor of the Buck Run Baptist Church in Frankfurt. Pastor Well is a podcast dedicated to helping servants of the Lord be faithful in ministry, especially those who are called as pastors. A question that I am asked a lot and want to answer today is about staff relations. How can I, as the lead pastor, a pastor teacher, relate to staff members? What does that look like? And the truth is, this is sort of a 360 degree answer. Uh, This is not true merely for the lead pastors, but really the way any uh, pastoral staff and church staff relate to one another. But let let me go at it first from the perspective of the lead pastor. I'm going to tell you that I think predictability is one of your greatest marks of of leadership. I think a good leader is clearly and cleanly predictable. In other words, I never want anybody on my staff facing a problem and they're sitting in a room with other staff or church leaders going, man, what do you think Dr. York wants us to do here? I want to be so clear in my convictions and commitments that they know the answer to the question. Now, to do that requires, I think, clear representation in two areas. The first one is convictions. So I am a convictional leader. I lead by conviction, from conviction, and we do not compromise on issues of true biblical conviction. I distinguish that from preferences. There are certain preferences I have that I don't claim are biblical. I just that, That's my preference. Maybe there's a Uh, a cultural or social issue involved. I go, we're not going to do that because I I think that hurts us in the culture. It's not a biblical issue at all, but, you know, we're going to do it this way. Uh, But the biblical conviction trumps everything else. Now, within my biblical conviction, then the second area we think about is what I would call pragmatism. What works? I'm never going to compromise my convictions for pragmatism. But within my convictions, I'm always saying, what's the best thing to do here? What accomplishes what we want it to accomplish best? How can we do this in a way that gets the task done in a way consistent with our beliefs? Now, when you walk your staff through that over and over and over, eventually you don't need to be in the room. That's what they're asking. Is there anything about this issue? that violates our convictions, okay? If not, then what in this issue works or doesn't work? And that's the sta- That's the conversation the staff have, even when I'm not in the room. I'm going to make a confession here. Uh, I've been senior pastor of Buck Run a long time. I've not been to a finance committee meeting for years. And it's not because I don't care about our finances, and it's certainly not because I'm, I ignore them. That would be at my own peril. It's that my finance team and my executive pastor know clearly the convictions by which I've led us, and then they know the pragmatic kind of uh, application that I want made in our church. So I don't have to be there. Uh, They're never going to cut our missions giving. They're not going to do it. They know that violates my convictions and the convictions established by our church, they don't even talk about it. It's not, they don't bring it up. I don't, so I don't have to be in the room. And they manage our finances really, really well. Uh, They've got a track record of doing that. I have entrusted our executive pastor to represent me, which he does superbly. He knows my convictions and my commitments. Uh, and he knows my pragmatics, and he represents that well. The committee knows it. And, man, they've d- they've done a great job taking care of our finances. They look at every single check written. They make sure that everything is done according to what our church has voted on in the annual budget. Why do I need to be there? So, again, this, this takes years. You, you don't do that year one. I'm in year 19. And we've been through a relocation 
and a building. And so we've had plenty of opportunity to exercise those commitments, those convictions, and those pragmatic decisions so that now we really trust each other. Uh, and I know I don't need to be there unless they ask me to be there for some specific reason. Uh, and so I would tell you, you've got to be real clear in your commitments and uh, your commitment to conviction and to pragmatic, what does it work, what works. The other thing you've got to inculcate with your staff is a sense that we're for each other. So even though I'm the lead pastor at Buck Run, I value my other pastors immensely. I cannot imagine any scenario in which they would say, well, you don't think you ought to do that, that I would say, yeah, I don't care, I'm doing it anyway. I'm just not going to put them or myself in that uh, in that scenario. We're for each other. I want them to succeed. They want me to succeed. Man, they take care of me. I, I often learn well after the fact of things they've done to make my job easier and the way they think ahead of time of how they can serve and help me, how they can serve our congregation. And man, we're for each other. There's no, We don't have turf wars. We help each other do our jobs. We're looking out for each other. So, you know, it, Buck Run, it's not unusual for, um, let's say, our student pastor to weigh in with our worship pastor. Uh, hey, here's something I think that you did that maybe doesn't work well, and you ought to do it this way. And we've got total freedom to do that. We're, we're not critical just for the sake of being critical. We're trying to help. We think through things together. Uh, when we meet, we we really are for each other. There's no undermining. There's no subterfuge. Every now and then, somebody does something that I like. I don't understand why you did that. And in fact, I, with my years of of experience uh, and insight, might think, okay, I know you you didn't do that. You didn't intend to hurt somebody or something when you did that, but that makes no sense. Explain to me what you were thinking when you did that. Listen to me tell you why I think that wasn't helpful. We have that conversation. Uh, years ago, I heard a preacher named Gene Mims. Uh, he said, you know, you're, you need to give 10 attaboys for everyone you jerk. Uh, it's probably twice that. It ought, maybe it ought to be 20 attaboys for everyone you jerk. His point was people need praise a lot more than they need correction. And, you know, we want to help each other. We want to serve each other. I don't need to fuss at them. There's just a lot of fussing in the world already, and they're getting fussed at by other people. I want to encourage them. Now, I'm going to be honest with them. If I think, you yeah, know, that wasn't helpful, I'm going to say why that wasn't. But uh, if it's in doubt, we're going to talk about it. Why did you do that? And we're going to be clear and communicating to our congregation what we're doing. We're also going to let the congregation see the way we love each other. It is very possible that sometimes people in a congregation, that, well, they want to do exactly what children sometimes do, try and come between their parents. You, you just can't allow that. The same way a parent needs to say, hey, you're never welcome to come between me and your mom. We're a team here, and uh, there's a pecking order, and you're below our relationship. Sometimes pastors need to say to church members, look, you're really not welcome to try and turn us against each other. We're for each other. There's one purpose, one ministry, and we're trying to follow the Lord together, and we're going we're gonna to talk through it. You know, we have personality differences. Sometimes it's hard. I've had guys on my staff that were like oil and water. They were super talented, and sometimes you get really – highly talented and opinionated people in the same room, they're going to have differences of opinions. And this is where you've got to coach them through the way to disagree, the way to love one another, the way to affirm one another, encourage one another, and to remind each other. We're for each other. We're not, we're not trying to hurt each other. No one of us is trying to look better than the others. In fact, we're sometimes trying to cover up uh, each other's mistakes and faults, not in a a bad way, but I'm just saying what we're not doing is highlighting someone's weaknesses. Like Noah's sons, we, we walk in backwards sometimes to cover their nakedness. And we're not talking to church members and saying, man, 
you know, he just drops the ball a lot. We don't do that. We, we have the conversation with each other. And furthermore, I would tell you that when we know we're for each other, we're clear in our convictions, that's when you can really empower staff to make decisions. And more and more, they make good decisions. I affirm their decisions. We talk about those decisions. And, and I can just trust them entirely. And God really uses that. That just creates a healthy balance in the church. The church sees, man, our pastors love each other. They're for each other. They're serving the Lord. And any one of us can say that that relationship helps each of us to pastor well.